Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I would like to also add my voice uh, of welcome uh, to my Oireachtas colleague, Alan Farrell, and to uh, all of the great guest teacher. I see at least one teacher, two teachers, and students from Pope John Paul uh, Primary School in Malahide. Um, I had the great good fortune to meet Pope John Paul, now Pope St. John Paul, who, who was a tremendously uh, charismatic figure and uh, who was a great champion of human dignity and respect for every person, however vulnerable, however weak, um, uh, and of course influential in bringing uh, down the Iron Curtain, ending the harsh communist government in Russia and so on, and creating a space where people could talk about human freedom and the honour that is due to every uh, single human person. And uh, he would have been uh, delighted to know that there is a school uh, named after him and that we have this wonderful bunch of students uh, here in our national parliament today because you are the leaders of the future. You are the people who in the future will be voting to decide who makes the laws that will organise our country and our society. And it's very important that we get good people into politics who are thinking not just of themselves and what they need, but thinking of the people they love and the community that they live in and the world around them to try and make it a better place. And we started a competition in recent years, and hopefully in a few years you'll be taking part, where we get students to write essays about the importance of getting involved in politics. The Can Corla, who is the head of our houses, says it's important that we get people more interested in politics, and it's important that we get more people interested in politics. And he was thinking of people like you, the next generation of leaders. So can I encourage you to enjoy your day here with us? We're honoured to have you here. And can I encourage you to pay, in, pay whatever, I know you've got busy lives, there's a whole lot going on between sport and friends and school and all of that, but I hope you'll take time to think about how do we, how do we make the rules in our country? And when you see the politicians on the television, they're not all bad, you know? In fact, most of them are trying to do their best, but think about where you might be involved in the future in helping to make decisions for everybody's benefit. So a sincere and warm welcome to you today. I think we're all uh, delighted to see you here among us. Okay. Um, so if I might just um, resume then, I have an amendment down to this um, legislation. Uh, yeah. Four and seven are related and may be discussed together by agreement. Is that agreed? Yeah. And this, this is um, about amending, uh, if we take, we'll start with uh, amendment number three, in page six, lines 10 and 11, to delete the words within, hundred, within 100 metres of an entrance to either house of the Oireachtas. So just, um, I suppose, to resume uh, from where we are, uh, page six, um, the clause as it subsequently, as it, as it currently stands, says, Nothing in section 2, subsection 2, shall prohibit a person from engaging in lawful protest, advocacy or dissent within 100 metres of an entrance to either house of the Oireachtas, provided such protest, advocacy or dissent is not directed at a specific relevant health care premises or persons accessing a relevant uh, health care premise, premises. Now, um, clearly, uh, this is... Uh, this, um, section uh, 3 subsection 1 as it stands is designed uh, to establish a principle that regardless of whether there's such a healthcare premises within 100 year, within 100 meters of the entrance to the either house of the Oireachtas it is so important that people in a democracy uh, be able uh, to express their legitimate political views, in this case about the injustice of abortion, and in this case to uh, invite those who might be contemplating abortion generally uh, to consider that there is always help available uh, to, to, to help them make a better uh, life-giving choice for, for themselves and their babies. So it, it's seen clearly um, by the drafters of this legislation uh, that there is something so important about freedom of expression uh, in the context of democratic uh, participation uh, that which, there should be no limits uh, on a person's ability uh, to uh, communicate um, uh, uh, outside of either house of the Oireachtas. And members will recall that last, at the last session when we were discussing a previous amendment, I was making the point that this free speech 
principle is so important that we should be at pains to protect it in universities and institutes of higher education as well. And that anything that would interfere with a person's um, ability uh, to communicate important ideas on this very life and death topic um, is, is a problem in our democracy. And that's why I have um, questions and concerns about the constitutionality um, of this um, legislation. Um, and um, the, 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 um, that, 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 that principle uh, that free speech um, uh, should be protected, of course, there's no absolutes when it comes to people's uh, rights, even their, uh, their constitutional rights. And it is certainly the case that where a person's uh, free speech or use of their free speech privilege, if you like, um, could impact on another person's welfare or safety, um, then there, are, there can be legitimate legal limits. And as I pointed out last week, those limits are there if you look at our public order legislation. Um, which it makes it an offence to engage in threatening, abusive, or incitement, uh, sorry, uh, or intimidating, uh, or indeed in some cases obscene uh, communication. So clearly there, there, there are limits to free speech. But I think what we've seen so far uh, in, our, in our attempts to legislate around this issue is the need for a very, very a careful balance to be drawn uh, so that, you know, my... Um, right to express my ideas and views, especially on important topics, but not just on important topics, is only limited to the extent necessary in order to protect you. Um, and I suppose that's what's, and perhaps I can speak more freely now that our younger people have gone, because I didn't want to be discussing the obscenity of abortion or of the government's proposal here in their, premises, in their presence. Um, but what's really disgraceful about this legislation is that it, it, it tears up the rule book. Uh, about a freedom of expression and tries to create a, a unique uh, category uh, of, of human behaviour, namely the carrying out of abortions, uh, and tries to basically say, and that shall be uh, above scrutiny uh, to an unprecedented degree, and literally unprecedented degree, because there's no parallel that I can think of where we've ever legislated before. Um, and to be doing that, as I have said, in circumstances where there has no problem uh, been disclosed. And I'm going to give more spe specific details on the fact that the case simply hasn't been made out successfully and that there is any breaches of public order or any intimidation of people going on. Uh, and I have challenged the Minister and I challenge him here again to give us chapter and verse on who he has been consulting with and who has said what and what evidence he has received. Because the world and its mother knows um, that the two things about the provision of abortion in this country is that it has been very damagingly stitched in to the medical and healthcare system to such a degree that it would be impossible to know any, at any point who's entering what premises for what reason. And that is doing an awful lot of damage to the practice of, uh, uh, of medicine uh, in our country. But what it at least does is it gives comfort uh, to those who don't like to hear any criticism of abortion, that there can be no um, you know, direct um, protesting of abortion uh, of a kind uh, that goes on in countries where they have specific abortion clinics. And, and I do not say that there should be no standards about what conduct should be permissible outside such abortion clinics. I, I would be strict on that, in that anything that would ever be uh, threatening, uh, abusive, insulting or obscene uh, should be, should be um, prevented. So in, in relation to this particular amendment then, um, what uh, my amendment supported by uh, Senator Keoghan, and I would speak to three and four together, removes the clause within 100 metres of an entrance to either house of the Oireachtas. Um, and at section, uh, at amendment four then, removes the phrase within that 100 metres. And what that would mean is that the section would then read, nothing in section 2.2, or two, subsection 2, shall prohibit a person from engaging in lawful protest, advocacy, or dissent provided such protest, advocacy or dissent is not directed at a specific relevant healthcare premises 
or persons accessing a relevant healthcare premises. And I would invite my friends and colleagues on the Shannon benches here to try and think about this as objectively as they can. And I know there's pressure on people who are in political parties. But is that not the honourable compromise? Because basically it doesn't create some kind of a cordon sanitaire out of which, outside of which dirty people, allegedly, who have uh, conscience concerns about abortion and who wants to discourage it gener generally in our society. Um, but instead of creating this unprecedented cordon sanitaire, um, it simply says that if you protest or advocate or dissent, you do not direct at a specific uh, relevant healthcare premises or persons at accessing it. So you could have, uh, uh, you could have a, a, a law uh, backed up by regulations that says, if you're holding a poster outside uh, the Rotunda Hospital or the new National Maternity Hospital, because tragically, one of the situations that has resulted from the uh, political about face of recent years is that we have gone from a situation where healthcare premises in the context of the delivery of maternity care could not uh, end the life of an unborn child. Um, uh, obviously, necessary healthcare procedures were always allowed even if that resulted um, in the loss of the life of the child, but that there couldn't be the deliberate targeting of an unborn child in any maternal, maternity healthcare setting. Now, that was something that I thought was very good and a credit to our country. Um, but we have gone to the exact opposite now, which is it is not possible to have a maternity healthcare facility that is designed around and ethically and professionally driven towards protecting both mothers and their unborn babies. So we have gone from one model that completely excluded one area of activity to now another model that completely excludes the kind of health care that many doctors and um, specialists would wish for and which many, many ordinary people, including those uh, who voted um, in, in the, in the, including those who voted no in the 2018 referendum, and I dare say included many of them who voted yes, because there are people who voted yes in the 28 referendum who, who wanted abortion to be a possibility in certain cases, but they didn't necessarily want it to be mandatory on every single um, maternity healthcare premises. They didn't necessarily want to exclude the possibility of a different ethical and professional approach being allowed to breathe consi consistent with top medical standards. So we have a disastrous new intolerance of an alternative model of maternity, maternal health care delivery. And I don't think that most of the people of Ireland wanted uh, such intolerance. You know? And this was always presented uh, as, as an issue of choice. Well, it's, if, an issue, if, if it's an issue of choice, yes. then, then it's not an issue of choice if you are a young uh, medical student who wants to specialise in obstetrics. I can tell you that, Aaron, my friend and colleague. You'll be a second-class citizen if you believe that the unborn baby deserves to be protected and that you want to be the top obstetri obstetrician in your field but you don't want to kill an unborn child. How much space is going to be made for you in the medical profession? You won't be, re you won't be required, you won't be required. I know that the minister is, is uncomfortable with, 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 uh, with some of the ground being covered here, but he's, he and his predecessor, Simon Harris, bear huge responsibility uh, for the injustice that's now going on, which does a, a, a disservice to both mothers and their unborn children in, in this country because of the, 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 the vacuousness of their political approach and the completely unprincipled attitudes that they have now uh, to the protection uh, of human life. So my point is simply this, and it is, by the way, relevant to the amendment, because what we're talking about here is, is there to be space 
for dissent in Irish society on the issue of abortion? And I think the answer to that is, from this minister, no. He will pretend that you can somehow gather wherever you like. But if you look at what's happening here, this government is in the pocket of special interest groups who do not want to hear any suggestion that abortion is not healthcare, that abortion is not ethical, that abortion is not professionally good. And for that reason, their attitude to abortion advocates is that when they say jump, this government says how high? Even to the extent of bringing in legislation that has been effectively said by the Garda Commissioner not to be necessary, because we have laws to deal with any problems that could arise, and where no uh, medical institution that I am aware of has reported of any problems uh, that cause uh, for a legislative response. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the Minister and the Government are in somebody's pocket. I don't mean financially, but ideologically they are um, on the hook. Can and I just ask you, Senator, um, yeah, could yeah. you stick to the amendment? I am sticking to the amendment, because what this, what this amendment is about... Without, without interruption, well, Senator. What this amendment is about is about creating the space for free speech. And what I am demonstrating is that this government is on board with an agenda to curtail free speech in Irish society. And, you know, and when you think about the difficulty of an idealistic young medical student or a nurse indeed coming up through the system who wants to be the best they can be in helping to provide uh, to care for other human beings but they don't want to be involved in the killing of an innocent child. They are second class citizens under the health system that this minister is driving. And that is why we have to look with great caution at what is being proposed in relation to safe access zones. There are people who strongly believe that abortion is a civil right and it should be legal in this country, but who do not agree with this legislation because they are Democrats, because they believe in free speech, and because they insist that if somebody says that there is a problem of intimidation in our society, that there should be some kind of a, a proper test that is satisfied. Um, before you go legislating to curtail people's freedom. So what the section would read if amended is that nothing in section 2, subsection 2 shall prohibit a person from engaging in lawful protest, advocacy or dissent, provided such protest, advocacy or dissent is not directed at a specific uh, relevant healthcare premises or persons accessing a relevant healthcare premises. And what I'd say to you, Minister, is if you have any honour, this is the honourable compromise. Because what it does is, it says, if you're protesting about the injustice of abortion, or if you're holding up a placard where you're offering assistance in general to people who might be contemplating an abortion and you want to offer them support so that they don't make a decision that they may end up regretting and that will certainly end the life of an innocent child. If you want to get that message out there in society, that's an important message if you believe that it's true. And there should be the minimal of restrictions preventing you from doing it. And if the minister is genuinely worried that that could result in an incident or a moment where a person is harassed or intimidated, I would be completely shoulder to shoulder with him in making sure that such um, uh, intimidation or harassment would be against the law. But I remind him that the guard, the commissioner said that we already had the laws to deal with any problems that could arise in this area. But what this clause as amended by my, if, if it were accepted, if it is accepted, as I hope it will be accepted, um, from, from, from Senator Keoghan and myself, it would, it, would, it would put into law the principle that any protest, advocacy or dissent is not directed at a specific uh, relevant healthcare premises. So imagine the poster outside uh, the new National Maternity Hospital, and I think that was where I led, led to my aside about the corruption of medicine and the lack of diversity. So I won't go on that again, but I'll say this. If there's a poster outside the National Maternity Hospital, wherever it's located in the future, St. Vincent's or Vincent's or whatever it's going to be called, uh, and it says, shame on the people carrying out abortions here. Might well be a matter of shame that there would be abortions carried out in the National Maternity Hospital. But this 
clause, as amended by Sharon Keoghan and myself, would say that that type of poster would not be allowed because it would be directed at a specific healthcare premises. And, and certainly it would not be allowed if it said, you know, Dr. X, Dr. So and so is carrying out abortions here. That's not medicine. That would not be allowed. If it said, you should not have an abortion here, probably wouldn't be allowed because it's directed at a person. But if it's more general and it's getting out the message about abortion, then it isn't directed. It's what it is doing. It is as much directed against the public and reminding them, you know, that this is uh, an ongoing uh, issue in our society. So I would ask my, my colleagues on the benches here to, to consider. They don't have to vote for this amendment today. I'm not going to propose this and push this to a vote today because I'm going to think about it and I'm hoping the minister will think about it and we can look at it at report stage, hopefully. I take it report stage isn't up today. It's not been rammed through, uh, hopefully not. No, it's not. Thank, thank God for small mercies. But, you know, we could at least think about this and say, we'll look at this in time for, for report stage. But it gets rid of this insulting cordon sanitaire idea, but it protects the principle that protest, advocacy, or dissent be not directed at a specific uh, relevant health per per premises or person accessing a relevant uh, healthcare premises. Um, and I think what this would also do by the way, and it's an important point. It would help prevent the bill from criminalizing protest or pro-life activity unwittingly carried out within the vicinity of zones. So for, let's say, for example, you have a person who is standing by, uh, maybe having a conversation about abortion with somebody that's overheard, or a person who might be silently praying, which is what some people do, and in a democracy they're entitled to do it, and we can talk about that, or are, are engaging in one-to-one -one advocacy that, that's freely chosen by people, or indeed ambulatory events where people might be uh, taking part in a march, uh, or dignified um, witness um, walk, or march, um, and, that, that, and were that to take them within the 100 meters um, zone. All of those potential problems would be obviated uh, by the acceptance of uh, amendments uh, three and four. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Mullen. Um, before I go on to the next speaker, may I welcome um, the students from all right, Rehab Care in Kilkenny, who are guests of Minister Malcolm Noonan, and also um, the students from Kells Community School, uh, who are guests of Deputy uh, Damien English, mm -hmm. and also, I understand, um, Senator Mullen, you have two guests in the audience yourself, so just to say you're all very welcome. Uh, Senator Clonan. Uh, uh, I, I just want to speak generally to the amendments as set out here, uh, but in particular to six. Uh, and just three, four and seven, uh, Senator Clonan. Okay, so three, four and seven. So look, basically, uh, in relation to this issue of safe zones, uh, I want to speak briefly about just personal lived experience in this regard. Um, so I have uh, five children and I've attended the, the births of all of my children. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, as, as I set out here yesterday and before, in the case of one of my children, um, she, she did not survive in the, the, the delivery suite. And uh, she, unfortunately, my little daughter died by way of cord accident at, at, at full term during delivery. And Unlike all of the other deliveries, uh, this was a completely silent event. And I can only, I can't speak highly enough of the, the midwives and the medical staff in the Coombe Hospital. Uh, and actually my daughter Leoden would have been 21 years old this week had she survived. And so we as a little family found ourselves in that situation. 
And what happens is the midwives uh, bring you to a side room, which are your little baby, and give you some time to spend with her. And another thing that they did was they had a, a little instamatic camera, a little Polaroid camera, so that you could take a photograph of your little baby um, before she is taken away to the mortuary and for whatever procedures they, they undertake there. Um, I had brought a, a baby grow for my daughter, a little, it, I remember it was white, it had little red hearts on it, I still have it. But she was so tiny and so small that um, it was, it, she, she couldn't fit in it. So the midwives had a little piece of curtain material and they made a little dress for her and we dressed her in it uh, with a little safety pin and we took the pictures with the Polaroid camera because these are things you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of in a situation like that. After a period of time had elapsed, the midwives told me to, you know, just take your time with your daughter, Leadham, the, the grey lady. And they had a little wicker basket and said, when you're ready, put her into the little wicker basket and you can put a towel on, on top and bring her to the nurse's station. And so that's what we did. Eventually, um, I put my little daughter into this wicker basket, put the towel on, and then walked to the nurse's station. And you're passing by, you're passing by expectant mums and families in the corridor. You know, they're walking up and down and breathing. And you're walking past with your, all your little hopes and dreams in a little basket. And when I got to the nurse's station, I mean, they know this situation, They've, they see it. Actually, I think they see it every day. Because one in four pregnancies end in stillbirth. And so my, my point here is that people who go seeking the services of obstetricians, gynecologists, midwives, and so on, it's not as presented in popular culture or in Hollywood or by people who perhaps have not been in that space. It's, it's, it's not an environment where you want to encounter any kind of protest, any kind of intervention, whether that be silent prayer or any of the other means that are set out in the act. And I do accept that uh, Senator Mullen has an an ideological perspective, a deeply felt Philosoph religious, philosophical and moral position on the protection of, of the unborn. And I, I, I understand that argument and I accept I it. it. As a human rights position. Yeah. And, I, and I, I completely accept the position that you're coming from. I recognise it, I respect it. Um, I'm coming from a different philosophical perspective. So we, we differ on that, but I do respect the space and place that you're coming from. But I would say as a person who has experienced these life events, that notwithstanding any concern or human rights or philosophical concern that you have, this isn't the place or the space or the environment to have. No woman or man should be confronted with this. Uh, and, and I think of the the French laws around the saete, having a, a laicized space in civil society, where there should be places in our, in our public space that are free of religious iconography or religious uh, rules, whether that be Islam, Judaism, Christianity, that the, the civil space is a, a laicized space, la saete. And, and I, I agree with that in principle, specifically as it applies to this. So in the same way that we would ask people not to protest at um, accommodation that has been designated for, for refugees, asylum seekers, or people seeking international protection, we would say, if you have a protest or a concern, you know, bring it to Leinster House. 
there's an appropriate place. And I would say similarly, this is where my concerns lie, that safe spaces and safe zones are absolutely essential. And uh, I just wanted to put that on the record and, and how it flows from lived experience or personal experience. Many people who are going to seek the services of medical practitioners, whether they be GPs in the local community, you know, many of them are going for, you know, they're, they're people who are in, in extremis, they're at a particularly vulnerable point in their life. And it can be for so many different reasons because healthcare isn't, is, is messy. It's not, it's not easy, but particularly gynecological obstetric maternity issues are very, you know, it's, it's a very, very dynamic area and people are coming from all sorts of reasons. And my fear would be that some person who's at that point of vulnerability might not seek the necessary medical attention if they're confronted with um, whoever it might be. And I, I see it in, in my own local area where I live. Uh, I see a group that regularly stand outside a, a, a GP practice and engage in very, very performative, um, sort of very clearly signaling their displeasure and objection to what's happening, which is the provision of healthcare. And how are they to know that any woman, uh, you know, visiting that GP, what, what, what their situation is? So I, I would just say, I just wanted to put that on the record that um, I had, would have an issue um, with that type of, I, I, I suppose, rather stated in the negative to stated in the positive, that we do need safe zones, particularly as it applies to this specific set of circumstances, notwithstanding all of the concerns you've raised also about freedom of expression and freedom of speech. I, I, I understand the arguments and I, I accept the, you know, your, where you're coming from, but I just I don't agree with it. And uh, I just wanted to set that for the record. And uh, thanks for allowing me to speak. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Thanks, Senator McGregor. <clears throat> oh my God, uh, last year, look, um, I, I want to say that I, I don't, I, I, I think that this is the first time I've spoken this, on this, um, this bill, um, and you're very welcome, and I'm, I'm taking over, I'm just covering for my colleague, Senator Clifford Lee, who can't be here today. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's important just to, 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 to speak about the reason for this bill, and the reason why I, I think that the, the, the amendments should not be accepted, because and exactly what Senator Clonan has said, that when people are going in for, for gynae, gynae, gynae care, obstetrics, you've no clue what's going on. Um, and I too was a parent that left empty handed out from the coom. Um, and it is the most desperate walk of your life. And when you're walking through those corridors and these beautiful pregnant women all around you, and all you want to do is hold your own baby. And then if you are accosted outside, and it does feel, you might not seem that it, that it would be accosting, but it is to be reminded of what you have left behind or that you didn't get a chance to have. And as someone who has, who has a baby, who has lost babies, I just think that in a moment, <laughs> Um, we, 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 speak, we spoke about care for the mother and you're voting no on the referendum because you're respect for a mother. And you think that a mother shouldn't be taken out of the constitution. And if you care so much for the mother, and you care so much for a vulnerable mother who might have, after losing her baby, or, or has an abortion for whatever reason that she chooses that she needs to have that, because an abortion isn't a, isn't a happy thing. No one is happy about having an abortion. No one is happy about losing their babies. And I just think that in, if we're, you're actually serious about being care for a mammy, that you would have allowed a space and a safe space around a healthcare, a healthcare building. Because if we can't do that for a mammy, if we can't do that, Protest, we've everywhere else to, to protest. And I absolutely accept that, that your, 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 your beliefs and your wants for, you're, 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 not, you're not for abortion. I understand that. Personally, I, I would never want to have an abortion, never. 
but I'm a for choice. But I, like, I just think that we have to have some care and understanding for what goes on inside these buildings. And what heartache, what agony goes on. And if we don't have that, if we don't, can not allow that space in the modern Ireland, not allow a space for someone to grieve, for someone to breathe, for someone to leave a healthcare provider in, in peace. Well, God, where are we going? And we speak about care for the mother, you don't want to delete the mother out of the constitution. Um, and yet, we don't want to have respect for a mother. We don't want to have respect for a caring mother. We don't want to have, have respect and give that mother and father a breathing space. And I can tell you, Senator Mullen, if I had to be confronted by someone outside, telling, reminding me about the loss of my baby, it would have thrown me over the edge. I had in and out of the coom, I said four times because of it. And it was desperate. And to be confronted by that, by your protesters, or by peaceful whatever you want to describe it as, I think it really would have thrown me over the edge. I was at rock bottom. I didn't want to live. And it was only my family and my children that brought me out of that. So I think we need to have an understanding of that, and that is it's not about, it's not about denying people the free speech. It's not about that. It's about allowing people a free space to breathe, to grieve, and just to live. Cormagot. Conway. <coughs> Uh, Minister, you're, you're very welcome uh, here again today and uh, I think the interventions from both Senator Clonan and Senator McGreehan are very powerful and they do very much uh, explain clearly why um, we need uh, to create this safe space. As Senator McGreehan quite rightly said, uh, in order for people to breathe, in order for people to, 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 to clear their head, uh, uh, to come to terms with um, people go in and out of these facilities for many reasons. Uh, some of them joyous, some of them are not so joyous, some of them are tragic. Um, but whatever the reason, uh, people need uh, to be able to breathe. Uh, one thing I just want, one observation I wanted to make about the debate the last day is just I felt the use of language uh, you know, on both sides um, was over the top. Um, it was not necessary. Um, it was ill-tempered. Um, and um, so far today, that hasn't happened. And I will call on all sides uh, to make sure it doesn't happen because we're mature enough and respectful enough uh, to be able to have engagements here uh, without using ill-tempered language, uh, without using offensive language, and uh, respecting other people's viewpoints. And I think that's important. Um, I think Senator Mullen raises a, good, a, a very important point about the precincts of the Houses of the Oireachtas Minister. And um, like it's a tricky one because you know, democracy does, uh, and we are in a democracy, thank God, and we see what's going on in other parts of the world. Uh, we very much have to value uh, that we are in a democracy, and that does bring with it the right to protest. And it does bring with it the right to protest at the National Parliament. And I think it's a very tricky one if you had a healthcare facility uh, within 100 metres of Leinster House uh, where people generally assemble to protest, which is usually now on Mozart Street. Um, I, I think that you need to take a look at that. Um, and I think you need to respond appropriately uh, because it, it's, a, it's very dangerous territory uh, if you can't protest at the precincts of Leinster House if there is a housing protest uh, that's allowed and then suddenly you have a protest on issues to do with abortion that's not allowed. Um, like, I may not agree with the people protesting. Uh, a lot of the time I don't agree with the people protesting, whatever the issue is. Uh, sometimes I do agree with them. Uh, but the one thing I do respect is very much the right uh, for peaceful protest at the houses of the Oireachtas. Um, 
outside of that, I do believe that this legislation is necessary for the, the reasons very eloquently articulated by my colleague beside me and Senator Clonan, who has left, uh, and others. Um, I think that it's not appropriate to hassle people, uh, even if it's only covertly, uh, when they are uh, accessing medical facilities that are legal in our country. People might like the fact that they're legal. People may not agree with it, but the reality is they are. And, um, and as has been said already, people access to such facilities for a whole myriad and variety of reasons. Um, and sometimes with miscarriages and stillbirths and other very difficult and tragic uh, uh, outcomes. And you know, you should be able to leave the facility, go to your car in comfort to deal with your grief uh, uh, without being prompted or without seeing prompts or whether people are praying privately, quietly, uh, covertly or overtly. Um, I, I don't believe that that's appropriate and that we need to create the space. Uh, I think what, what does exist in France in the, uh, and, and in other countries, where there is parts of the civ civic space, the open space, that is free of all uh, uh, religious activities and protests and so on, where people can go in tranquil, uh, for tranquility and peace, uh, that that's, that, that's something that's, that's worth looking at in a wider debate outside of this very specific area uh, of discussion. Um, I think that, the, that um, you know, the, the debate here isn't being guillotined, and I welcome that, uh, and I hope that that does continue to be the case. Uh, I think that each of the amendments uh, that are tabled deserve to be debated uh, uh, at length. And you never know, an understanding might evolve and flow to the top where there is an understanding for the reason why government can't accept amendments. And at the same time, I think that the one about Leinster House is something that does need to be looked at and does need to be addressed. And I'd be very interested to hear what the Minister's observations uh, on that particular uh, area are, because um, as I've outlined already, the importance of it. And look at the importance of protests in this country. Uh, we are a democracy, it's essential. Uh, it's appropriate um, that the people uh, can voice their concerns, articulate their views, uh, make their feelings heard. Um, you know, that, that is uh, the core essence of democracy. Look what's happening in Russia at the moment. Uh, look what happened to people who came out for uh, the opposition leader's uh, funeral after he died. Look at the way they were treated. Um, you know, it's a fine line. Um, and, um, you know, I, I value what we have. Our democracy might be one of the oldest in Europe, but you know, in the overall context of humanity, it's not that old. It's, it's just over 100 years. Um, and if you look at that and you, you, you view that in the context of uh, time and memorial, that, that it, it's not very long at all. Um, we see what's happening uh, with Ukraine and Russia. We see the threat of what potentially is happening in the United States. The next eight months are going to be critical. In my, in you're speaking to three, four, and seven. Indeed, and I'm speaking about. The, uh, I'm speaking in the context, Alaska uh, uh, Hirlock, of the, the protests, uh, the, the, the amendment that's in regarding protesting at, at Leinster House, uh, and I suppose I'm, I'm drawing comparisons with the concerning developments that are taking place in the United States, and uh, we saw what happened in January 6, uh, 2020 and the challenges and the concerns there. And um, I, you know, I, I think that we just have to be careful. And um, I, would, I, I would urge the Minister to be reflective and to take on board uh, the concerns about uh, the need to be able to protest uh, at the vicinity of Leinster House, because I think that's very important from a democratic perspective. Senator Cummings, Senator Gavin. Good, uh, Cahillock, Minister, you're welcome. I also want to um, give a warm welcome to Pushali Kundu from the National Women's Council, who's taken the time to be here today for this debate. I want to commend, in particular, Senator McGreen and Senator Clonan uh, for speaking so powerfully in relation to this. I think it's very hard to, to, to add to that, really. But just to briefly speak to the amendment, uh, just to say that as someone who has spent most of his life protesting, as a trade unionist, as a socialist, um, 
There is nothing here threatening protest. What we're calling for is a 100 metre cordon. And the reason we're calling for it has been set out extremely powerfully uh, by two previous speakers. Because in that moment of difficulty, the last thing a woman needs to see is protesters of any kind. Um, and the idea that somehow this is a massive curtailment of the right to protest is simply false. It's 100 metres. That, that, that's all it is. It's just enough space uh, to give someone dignity and privacy in those very challenging circumstances. And I think a key principle that all of us should believe in is that anyone seeking health care has the right to privacy and dignity and respect. I think that's what unites most of us uh, in the Shanna Chamber. Uh, and I want to again commend it, you know, so many people who have played a key role in um, pushing for this legislation. It was almost laughable to, to, to hear Senator Mullen talk about uh, the minister being open to special interest groups. Uh, I mean, I have to say that's nonsense. Uh, there's been a five-year campaign to, to, to get here today uh, of ordinary people. Um, and while I said the last day, and I do, I disagree fundamentally with the minister on many things, I do want to commend him for, for the fact that he's taken this bill forward. Um, and it's got nothing to do with special interest groups. It's to do with the fact that when we passed that repeal uh, all those years ago, there was an immediate commitment from the then Minister Simon Harris that he would act to establish safe zones. Because we know and see what's happened in other parts of the world, uh, including uh, America, where, where, where there's horrendous intimidation uh, towards women seeking health care. And it's taken five years to get to this stage. So... Uh, we just need to get this done. We need to get this done because it was very much understood, very much understood at the time of the referendum. That's all I have to say. Senator Kjorgen. Thank you. And uh, I want to commend Senator Clonan and Sen Senator McGeehan for sharing their personal stories with here, here with us th uh, this afternoon. But I also want to share mine, because I would have lost two children as well um, through miscarriage. I have two, but I also lost two. And it's difficult, I, and I, I recognise that. But for me, people are calling these, the, the, the people that stand out these, outside these uh, centres and outside these hospitals as protesters. I, I wouldn't call them that because to me they're not protesters. They are engaged in prayer, quiet, quiet prayer, for the unborn and for the mother. So for me, not that I, I witnessed these outside the, the places where I had my children in the UK, but I would have felt comfort in knowing that there was somebody outside that door, praying for me, what, for what I was going through in those losses. And praying that, you know, even my births of my children would have gone well. And some of them, went, one went well and one didn't go so well. So, they don't intimidate me in any way. And I'm sure they don't intimidate many, many mothers in this country, because they are there engaged in quiet prayer praying for the unborn, praying for the mothers, praying for the mothers that are about to give birth. Prayer is, it, it has many, many forms. So, Minister, you know, this bill would ensure uh, that you would not, uh, our members would ensure that you would not criminalise legitimate protests or pro-life activity, which happens unwittingly uh, passed by a, a designated uh, premises. In Dublin each year, there's a March for Life, which attracts around a thousand people or more participants who pass peacefully through the city centre. If this bill were enacted as is, there's a concern that events like March for Life would be prescribed on a purely ideological basis. For example, the area around Stevens Green has several GPs and buildings which would be regarded as designated premises and thereby have 100 metre zones around them in which any activity likely to influence someone's decision to have an abortion would be impacted. This inevitably would pose difficulties 
to the organisers of the perfectly legitimate public events. The right, for, the right of citizens to freely organise legitimate protests, gatherings and rallies which stand for the pro-life message must be protected. And Minister, no evidence has been produced by you that any public order offences were ever recorded. None. Not one piece of evidence. You know, I'm shocked that a government is so afraid of the people of faith of this country, the people who gather quietly outside the hospitals and the centres. I'm, and to bring this draconian legislation in, I think it is, it's a sad, it's a sad day for free speech in this country and a sad day for, for the unborn. Um, as regards, people say, come to the doll, come to the doll, come to Leinster House, protest here, protest peacefully here. You can't even do that anymore. There's barricades 100 metres around it. We are isolated from what the people are actually thinking and feeling on, on, on the ground out there. So tomorrow will be the International Day, International Women's Day. And the women of Ireland, I have no doubt, will stand up and say no, no to this government. They will not want to have their words taken out of the Constitution. Their words of women, their words of mothers, they will not want that done by this government. And I can tell you, I, I have a feeling on Saturday morning that this country is going to wake up and this government is going to wake up to a resounding no, no vote. And that might wake the government up and listen to what is happening on the ground. Because I think with these 100 metre zones and these barricades around this ivory tower that you're all living in, you might get a real feel of what the, the, the public is actually thinking out there. Not just in relation to this issue, but in relation to all the issues, whether it be the housing crisis, whether it be the health crisis that you are in charge of. So, Tomorrow is going to be a day of reckoning for this government, and I certainly hope that Thank the people of Ireland speak up. We're on amendments three, four, and seven. So thank you. Just, yeah. Senator Mullen. Um, thank you very much, Chairlig uh, Ganevi. There's a lot to respond to in what um, my friend Senator Gavin. Senator Mullen, just before you, sure. may I just uh, welcome the students from St. Kieran's College in Kilkenny, just to say you're very welcome. Very good. comes in for a second time. Take the, I'm happy to let the Minister respond, but I, w I do want to, while I'm on my feet, to take the opportunity of welcoming the students and perhaps teacher, if they're there, from uh, St. Kieran's College in Kilkenny. I had the pleasure of visiting that very fine establishment in the last year when I presented one of the highly commended awards um, to one of the students from there, Paul. Uh, whose turn is her name? I don't think he's there. It's probably... Uh, is Paul there? Yeah, you, know, you got your award from me. Uh, well done, Paul. Paul wrote a, an, a, an essay that was highly commended in our inaugural um, Oireachtas essay competition. And I got a wonderful welcome uh, in St. Kieran's. It's a great place to visit. I'm delighted that you're here today, Paul. I know I'm not the only politician in here whom you know as well. Um, so welcome to them. And um, just to let the students know, we're discussing a human rights issue here today, which is abortion. And whether it should be okay for people who believe that abortion is unjust to witness to that outside healthcare facilities. So you're here with a very dramatic discussion. Sorry, there's Senator, there's there's a lot of difference of opinion. Yeah, remind the Senator that we, you speak yeah. to the chair now. Yes, our colleagues. And now you've just, we, we've just, we have the honour now of having our session chaired by the Cahirlik of Shannon there and my friend and colleague, uh, Jerry Bottomer. But I, people often come in and out quickly as guests, and this is a very, very important issue that we're discussing here today because it touches on human rights and our respect for human dignity. So, delighted to have you here. I'm happy to give way to the Minister if he wishes to speak. Thank you, Senator. And Tara Lidahull. Sorry, the Minister. Um, Thanks, Mr. I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the contribution from my friend and colleague, Aaron McGreen, Senator McGreen. I have never heard a more powerful testimony and a more 
obvious reason for this bill. Put very simply, what Senator McGreen is saying that I heard was this is about creating a safe space for women and for their partners in sometimes very difficult circumstances. And unfortunately, we have a people opposing this, people saying we will not create a safe space, we will not respect any distance, we will not respect any privacy, we will not respect any dignity. When women are in the kind of situation that Senator McGreen and Senator Clonan have talked about, the opponents of this bill would say, we want to be right up in their face, we don't care what they're going through, it's important that we have all of our posters and all of our protests and we don't care what they say, we won't respect what they say, we will drive on. And I want to Sorry, commend Minister. Senator Clonan just, just, just one second, on Minister. what he has said Sorry, Minister, well. just one second. Could I just remind all members of whatever political hue or view you have? This is the chamber. You're entitled to come in and speak. Many of you have spoken very passionately this morning. I watched it in my monitor in between different meetings. Could I just ask, as we've done it in the past and again now, to be sensitive to each other and to be cognizant of the views without interrupting any other speakers or any and the minister. So, minister, without interruption, please. Uh, like Senator Morning. Mullen uh, again today has made many uh, false statements, uh, no, much, no, much false information, no, and he's made many insidious claims. For me, the most insidious claim that Senator Mullen has made is to allege that the women and their partners and our healthcare workers who are telling us that these protests are happening, Senator Mullen is saying, not true. Senator Clonan just told us about his personal experience where he lives and he sees it day to day. Senator Mullen's view, Senator Clonan just made that up. No, and so what Senator, Mullen, what Senator Mullen has challenged me and has, and has challenged the government. Sorry, sorry, Senator Mullen. Senator Mullen. Senator Mullen. You know, just let me just, just one second, Minister. You're, you're, you're provoking comment as well, to be fair, which, and that's and we're in a political chamber. You can't use the word lie in the chamber, please. Yes, Senator Kyogan, please, I'll chair the House, and when you get the pleasure and the, and the privilege of being able to be elected chair, then you can do so as well, please. Could I just ask, and you're a good friend of mine now, and I don't want to have a row with anyone on this matter, because it's a very sensitive, very considered matter with strongly held views, and I appreciate where you're coming from. I'm not trying to be unfair to anybody. Can you let the minister reply, and I'll let you back in again then, please? If I will do my best, but okay, if you just claim that Tom Clonan said that people were intimidating people, but he didn't say sorry, that. Sorry, Senator Mullen. It's about respecting it's the about, chair. It's about, it's about doing respecting three things. The truth as well. Sorry, Senator Mullen, please. It's about respecting the House. I will be fair in the chair, and I respect you, as you know, hugely. And Minister will be given the opportunity to speak. If you wish to reply to rebut, if you think you need to do so, I will call you again. This does not serve anybody's cause by this name calling by anybody on any side. Let's just have a sensible, sensitive debate, cognizant of the deeply held views on each side. And I respect that completely. So can I ask the Minister, without interruption, please, to reply, and I will call any member who wishes to come back in again. Okay? Thank you. Minister. Gurmagath Gehirlik. Senator Mullen has made many false claims in the chamber this morning. He has made many insidious claims in the chamber this morning. For me, the most insidious claim that the Senator continues to make is that women around Ireland and healthcare workers around Ireland and the partners of women around Ireland who are telling us that there are protests outside healthcare centres, that they feel intimidated and threatened by those protests. Senator Mullen has repeatedly and insidiously suggested that these claims are false. He has asked for any documented evidence. Last week, he challenged me and he challenged the government to name one single healthcare provider who would state that these protests were real. We just heard a powerful personal contribution from Senator Clonan, who clearly stated that these protests are happening very close to where he lives, and presumably uh, Senator Mullen does not believe Senator Clonan uh, either. And so what I'm going to do is respond directly to the false claims and the challenge that Senator Mullen has put forward. Senator Mullen asked for one, for me to, to, for me to reference, one registered healthcare provider. I reference the HSC, who I hope Senator Mullen will accept is a registered bona fide healthcare provider in our state. And what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to read the submission from the HSC to the Dáil Committee in pre-legislative scrutiny for this bill. Here's what the HSC have to say about this. Quote, maternity sites in Dublin have had some form of anti-abortion protest or activity on a weekly, if not a daily basis since the commencement of the service in 2019. This is a practice we have seen replicated in other regions at various intervals. This activity includes the display of religious images and messaging, graphic images of fetuses, and in some instances, physical and verbal aggression. There have also been targets, uh, targeted protests outside GP surgeries. The detrimental impact of this behaviour cannot be overstated. These anti-abortion protests, whether passive or active, have a significant psychological impact and extend to those availing of services other than abortion services, including, but not limited to, instances of pregnancy loss, stillbirth, and early neonatal death. They continue. In addition to service users, the women and their partners, two of whom we have heard powerful testimony from this morning, the HSE continues. In addition to service users, staff within primary and secondary care services have reported occasions where they have felt fearful on entering or exiting their workplaces directly related to the proximity and intensity of some anti-abortion protests. They continue. It is hugely distressing for these staff and personnel who have committed to providing a safe, high-quality termination of pregnancy service for them to be exposed to intimidation whilst going about their work. Access to abortion care will remain vulnerable in an environment where providers are threatened, harassed, or subjected to intimidating behaviour. That is the testimony from the HSC. Okay? That's what the HSC has said. Now, Senator Mullen clearly would have a say, well, the women well, are lying. You. I the deal with Senator Mullen, are don't are lying. Lying. Senator Clonan is lying. The HSC is lying. Everyone is lying. They're all making this up. It is utterly disingenuous. Senator it is Mullen, utterly please, disingenuous. Please. You should retract your insidious, I'll put you, nasty I'll put your arguments in their place in the a moment. Record. You're insulting every I'll ex, single I'll person expose your dishonesty who tries in a moment. to provide Don't these worry. services and access these services. I'll expose your dishonesty you are insulting in a the testimony to to from the people members, please. like Senator McGreen and, and Senator Clonan. And for me, Senator, I think your testimony and your approach to this is absolutely despicable and uh, disgraceful. And your approach is now, vacuous and unprincipled. Specifically, Chair, to the amendments. To the amendments please. seek yeah, to you, remove Lord. a safe zone for protest within 100 metres of the Oireachtas. So those who would say we shouldn't have this bill at all are now seeking to say, but we shouldn't have the 100 metre zone around the Oireachtas. Of course we should. And we're very cognizant that the Oireachtas is very close to existing healthcare providers. And we wanted to make absolutely sure that even though there are healthcare providers in close proximity of the Oireachtas, there could be no doubt whatsoever other than anyone who wants to come to the Oireachtas and protest can do so without any uh, uh, thought to any safe access zones because there is a completely safe buffer zone within this. So uh, I will not be accepting uh, these amendments. Garmaga, Garmaga, Garmaga. Thank you, Minister. Senator Mullen. Thank you. And could I just again ask members to be temperate in the language they use, in the words and the phraseology they use in the chamber of this august body. Thank you. I will be temperate, and I certainly won't mind if the Minister interrupts me or wants to offer a point of information. It's not a question of whether you mind or not, it's the question of the rules of the House and the, yeah. and the etiquette. Thank you. I regard the Minister's approach to being completely dishonest, representing a government that is completely dishonest, that corrals power, listens only to certain insiders. This Minister has an appalling record in not in any way engaging with pro-life people, respectful people who have a case to make. We saw the completely corrupt way in which he drove uh, the three-year review uh, into the abortion legislation. And notwithstanding, do you want to offer a point of information? I'll chair the session. The completely, Warren, thank you, Carly. And, and if, again, like I use the word, please, yeah. in terms of the language we use, yeah. 
and, and you're using the word yeah. corrupt, which, to be fair, is not what the Minister is, irrespective of your view, so if you could be judicious in your language, I would appreciate it. Thank you. He presided over a completely corrupt process, uh, whereby the uh, three-year review in abortion was supposed to be an independent person. He gave that commitment at a certain point. He said that there would be public recruitment of the person, and in the end, um, the government chose a person who was not independent and who had expressed views in favour of uh, changes in our abortion law. And the later attempt then to kind of shore up uh, that inadequacy and corruption in the process was, a, oh, it simply meant that they had to be independent from politicians and absolutely laughably thin. And that's why I say there is no other word for the government's approach in this. It is unprincipled, it is dishonest, it is reckless about um, uh, protection of human life. And it's also reckless, and I think this is coming out in the referendums and other campaigns we're having, that, that the government is more interested in getting its way than in consulting with ordinary people. It is more interested, and the minister is more interested in talking to insiders um, um, than in, for example, hearing from, even as a democratic obligation or courtesy, uh, the many, many representatives of the pro-life perspective in society, which says that both mothers and their unborn babies um, uh, should be protected. And there's something Borg-like for fans of, of Star Trek in which the minister and the government just, you know, plough on uh, mechanically as though there weren't ethical and professional concerns, as though there weren't countless good people in our society who want to witness respectfully to the dignity of both unborn babies and their mothers, and who deserve it, who would deserve at the very least uh, the courtesy. And I remember actually engaging with the minister a couple of years ago on, this, on, on these issues and saying, you know, um, would you consider meeting? Oh, I'll meet with anybody. Uh, but that was what was said to me off camera, so to speak. But when it came to requests to get a hearing from the Department of Health, I'm afraid it was computer says no, you know. So I, am, I, I, I don't have any respect for the way the minister carries out his responsibilities as a minister for health, particularly uh, in relation to, I don't have anything against you, minister, personally, but I utterly deplore uh, the way you have carried out your duties as Minister for Health and the government you represent have been utterly unprincipled and utterly dis disrespectful of human life and in recent times utterly disrespectful of dissent. The arrogance of power uh, is clearly on display. Yeah, now, we're on amendments yeah. dealing with a particular Agreed. bill, not about government. Thank you, government. Kylie. Yeah, thank you. Now, to respond uh, to what has been said, um, and I will take the Minister's first, but perhaps more important than the Minister's contributions have been those by my friends and colleagues in the Shannon, uh, Tom Clonan and, um, and um, uh, Aaron and, 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 and Paul. And of course, um, I'm very grateful to Sharon Kogan for her uh, courageous um, intervention as well. Uh, but to respond first of all to the what the Minister has said, he made a big play about the fact that I put it to him fair and square last week that he hadn't managed to give us any kind of chapter and verse in the way you would expect in a democracy in advance of a big change in the law, something quite unprecedented, something that curbs uh, free expression in an unprecedented way. You would expect that there would have to be a very good exceptional reason for it and you would expect uh, that there would be, you know, a considerable body of visible evidence making a case of a problem that cannot be otherwise solved, other than by legislation. And I brought to the Minister's attention uh, what the Garda the Commissioner had to say a couple of years ago, I think now, and he has not contradicted it, nor has he brought, nor has he indeed dared to refer to it, um, which was to say that, we, you know, paraphrasing the, the, the Garda the Commissioner, that we had laws adequate to deal with any problems. I also um, said to him that no a healthcare provider um, had given any evidence of complaint that he was able to draw our attention to. And he brandished with pride today a statement not from a healthcare provider that's involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, dealings with um, healthcare on the ground, but with the Borg-like bureaucracy that is the HSE. And he very conveniently has a submission from the HSE that says all the things that the government would like them to say, that alleges some instance of physical and verbal aggression. I would certainly deplore that, and I would suggest to the minister that there is law to deal with that on the statute books. Um, 
But of course, we don't know, by the way, whether this was just cooked up by somebody in the HSE as a convenient note to pass to the Minister through the Department of Health in due course, because we don't know if they're telling the truth or not. I have no doubt that it could happen. Um, but I would like if there could be some independent body, now not what the Minister means by independent, I mean somebody really independent, who would actually scrutinise what complaints were actually received by the HSE. But if they were, that's fine, the HSE is entitled uh, to brief the Minister, but it doesn't make out the case that I was calling for, which is that we would hear from healthcare organisations on the ground about complaints being made to them. Oh, I'd be delighted to take a point of for information the, the, uh, from I'm the Minister. Talking, I'm talking to the Chair. Well, you can Are only offer a point of information to me. No, can we, can we, Senator Gilgan, your interventions will not help the situation either. You, you, you're gesticulating to the Chair. The Chair has been asked, is there a point of information? Is it a point of order Senator or a point Mullen, of information? It's a point of order, I hope if it's, point of information, if it's a point of order, it's to the Cahir, look, if it's a point of information, it's to me, uh, Minister. No, I'm talking to the Chair. Oh, it's a point, so, point of order, so. It's a point of order, yes. Senator Mullen, I'm Just on a point of clarity, the submission has been, which... The, the senator appears to be suggesting that the HSC is lying. It wasn't. That's a point of information. Sorry, sorry, Senator Warren, let the minister finish, and then be, you'll be finishing. It's an official document. It's not. It's not a note to me. It's a. It's an presentation to the health committee to, to the Iraq Committee. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's thank a point you. of it. That was a point of information to me, Minister. I'd be very glad to take it, and it doesn't in any way advance your case. Needless to say, Again, because you have, you have you have you have very you have very you have very little uh, to advance your case except except government bluff and bluster. I'm afraid, and what 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 bothers me most about the Minister's bluff and bluster is that it trivialises the life and death nature of this issue. Um, I have absolutely no problem with the HSE putting on the record its wish to back up the Minister's case. I'd be very, very surprised if the Minister would go bringing forward legislation that didn't have the support of the HSE, because they are, as we put it, Asgelia, fitsche fuitsche. But this is the same HSE that is worryingly either in the pockets of politicians or of activists, as we heard in the context of the, the whole area of transgender and the treatment of, ch of children and adults with trans uh, gender dysphoria. No, well, I'm simply making the point, Senator. I'm simply making the point, I think it was Professor Donald O'Shea, the endocrinologist, who said, and again, I'm paraphrasing from memory, that the HSE uh, and the politicians were in the grip of the activists here, you know. So the idea that when we're dealing with the HSE, we're dealing with some kind of honourable neutral that is in capable of corruption by ideology, I'm afraid that idea has long since uh, uh, lost its, its credibility. I reiterate, however, that what the Minister has signally failed to do is bring forward evidence uh, from a single healthcare facility. Let's say, let's be clear, we are talking about people, and I wouldn't actually like to call them protesters, because the people that I would want to defend here today are the witnesses, and I'll say a little bit more about them in a moment. But he hasn't brought a single, you know, years into this debate, nobody has managed uh, to draw our attention uh, to a single um, um, healthcare providing institution that says actually uh, that there is a problem on the ground. Now I want to put on record something that the Minister uh, did cite um, in support um, uh, of, of, of his position. And I think in a funny kind of way, it, it kind of might illustrate uh, what I'm trying to talk about. The Minister in July 2022 issued a statement that included the following. I wish to acknowledge the helpful public discussion on safe access zones over recent months, and in particular the work of the Together for Safety group in informing the development of legislative proposals. Um, now, that is the only organisation outside of the HSE that I have uh, heard the Minister quote. And in relation to that organisation, the University of Limerick Hospitals Group was forced to take the extraordinary step of issuing a statement challenging claims that there had been intimidatory, quote unquote, anti-abortion protests outside its facilities. And last year, a spokesperson for the Cork University Hospital told, sorry, um, yes, last year, the spokesperson for the Cork University Hospital told the Examiner newspaper that, quote, to date, Cork, uh, CUMH has not received any complaints from patients regarding the protests. The spokesperson also explained that alleged protests are very infrequent and typically consist of between two and four people. So let's just reflect on that for a moment. Two university hospitals setting the record straight, one of them following claims from 
an abortion activist advocacy group together for safety. And the University of Limerick Hospitals Group and Cork University Hospital Group. And not only putting the record straight, but not in the Cork case having received any complaints from patients regarding the protests, and the spokesperson explaining that alleged protests are very infrequently and typically consist of between two and four people. So the public listening in, when they want to adjudicate who is being dishonest, the minister, when he's talking and having a go and spewing venom against people who are, as he puts it, in people's face, are the reputable um, institutions who make it clear that there hasn't been a problem. And just by way of, I suppose, coda to that, and, I, and, and you know, I might just reference one thing that's relevant to this. I was born in Port Yuncla Hospital in Ballinasloe. My mother nursed there. We have a long um, knowledge and acquaintance with that hospital and are very grateful for the health care that we as a family have received there over the years. And last December when I heard the sad news that the service of abortion provision would be extended uh, into Port Yuncla uh, in Ballinasloe, I, I, I made some comments that, uh, to the effect that I was very sad about that and I thought the tradition in the tradition of St. Francis of Assisi, indeed, that had led to the establishment of that hospital, hence the name Porti Uncula. Um, and I said that I encouraged people in Ballinasloe and the surrounding area to take every opportunity to engage with the medical and other staff at the hospital courteously and constructively to discourage the practice of abortion and to never let up until human life is fully respected again in Porti Uncula and in all other healthcare facilities in Ireland. And Cahirlig, would you believe that led People say we have privilege in this uh, house, but I suppose we have to rightly uh, be held to account uh, for any statements that we might make in press releases or elsewhere, um, and have no problem with that at all. But um, would you believe that that statement of courteous and constructive engagement led to a complaint uh, about me uh, to the Committee of Members' Interests in Shannad Aaron? Um, and it was claimed that I had not upheld my duty. And it's just relevant that yesterday it landed on my desk uh, that the Oireachtas uh, Committee met on the 17th of January and decided um, that this complaint uh, was priv frivolous and vexatious. And why is that uh, relevant? Because, of course, this frivolous and vexatious, vexatious complaint, it came from the Together for Safety group, or a member thereof, um, to whom I will give the charity of anonymity uh, in this chamber. But I merely make the point that these are the people that the minister is relying on. These are the, ideo the ideologues. And why is that significant? Because we heard today from friends of mine here in this chamber and I don't make light of their personal experience, Aaron and Tom. And the truth of the matter is that we are all of us flesh and blood. We are all of us have a, a mixture in us of emotion and intellect. And we all bring our life's experience and our reflection on our life experience um, to uh, the consideration of these issues. And none of us has a monopoly on compassion. And my own concern for the protection of unborn children, the protection of excellent standards in, medical, in maternal health care, and witnessing to the dignity of every human life, and hoping and working for a day um, when our hospitals will not be uh, places where the intentional termination of innocent life is characterised as abortion care or health care or any kind of care. Um, those people also, uh, people with that concern, also bring their emotions and their life experience into the situation. And therefore it is wrong to posit a difference between ordinary people who are suffering and people who might witness uh, to the dignity of human life as being merely protesters. When it is quite possible, and I would have no difficulty 
introducing, I suspect, if I were to try, uh, no difficulty introducing people here uh, to people who have witnessed uh, outside uh, hospitals or in the street um, against the injustice of abortion, who themselves may have suffered miscarriages, who themselves may have had abortions, but who know the value of a child, who know the importance of honouring authentic health care for the protection of mother and child, and who are not into judging any person, but who are simply trying to hold up a candle in the darkness that is Ireland's abortion law, with our massive increase in abortions in recent years, with our laws that don't provide uh, for any precautionary pain relief where late-term uh, abortions may be taking place and where we've had reports of the trauma uh, that, 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 that some healthcare people have experienced when they've seen uh, late-term abortions taking place and the infant em emerges alive and the whole question of whether there's palliative care in that situation. The barbarism that has des descended on us in some cases um, where we're, you know, it seems to me, rapidly catching up with Britain in our unthinking cruelty. Uh, all of this stuff um, feeds in to a consciousness among many people in our society uh, that there must be a better way than abortion. And when my friend and colleague Tom Clo Clonan spoke, and I wasn't aware of his personal story, indeed of the loss of his daughter Leiden, and I deeply sympathise with him with what he uh, suffered and his family, I deeply sympathise with you, Aaron, too, as I sympathise with Sharon about her experiences, and I sympathise with members of my own family. But um, the question is this, um, and Tom said it to me as he was leaving the chamber, he said, I understand your position. And I said to him, well, I, I don't understand yours, but I deeply sympathise with what you've gone through. Um, and the reason I don't understand it is because I believe that while a person can When a person suffers a trauma like this, it isn't necessarily at the point where they're leaving the hospital that they encounter um, upsetting things and realities. Many a person has encountered within hospitals themselves uh, the unwitting Many, many a person has encountered within the hospitals themselves maybe the unwitting cruelties um, uh, from healthcare staff who are under pressure uh, in a system that can sometimes be quite cruel and we all know the experiences that people have. So there's cruelty that can happen by accident and there is, un and there is intentional cruelty. And I think the distinction that we should draw is between anybody who would inflict intentional cruelty in the way they communicate around these issues, and the decent witnessing that people in a democracy should be able to do to the respect that is due to human life. And I noticed that my colleague Aaron referenced the referendum and more or less threw it in my face, so to speak, that since I oppose what I see is the disrespect towards mothers by their, by their being taken out of the Constitution. If that happens, hopefully it won't. Yeah. Is not part of this uh, no, bill. I'm only no, just no, responding but, to the but, point to of To be fair, I've yeah. given extraordinary attitude yeah. now. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're straying well beyond right. the amendments now, to be okay. fair to you. Well, all I will say is this, that, um, that there's no contradiction uh, between honouring mothers by recognising their particular role in the Constitution. Sorry, Senator McGreen. And the, 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 and no, 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 no. As I said earlier, let's, let's, let's send a modern reply, and, and, and if you wish to come back in, you can and, please come back in. And witnessing, and witnessing to the respect that is due to mothers and unborn babies. And I would remind my colleagues, Tom and Aaron, Paul and the Minister, that there are people who witness against abortion, who believe in the value of respecting human life, who support the idea of peaceful and honourable witnessing to that in public who don't believe dissent should be crushed. And among those people are people who have also suffered. And it's important that everyone here accepts that point intellectually and internally, that nobody has the monopoly of compassion here. It, this isn't a debate between unthinking, unfeeling, protest-minded people who are you know, not in touch with one side of their brain or another. 
This is all of us struggling, suffering humanity, trying to figure out the best way to order our society. And there are people who have suffered themselves, who believe that they should be able to witness to the dignity of the human life. There, there are people who have suffered themselves as a result of abortion, who would hope that their presence, their peaceful and respectful presence within the vicinity of a healthcare facility, without knowing who's going in for what, as I have reminded people already, we don't have a system where there's any possibility of a person feeling personally targeted. And that is the, is, 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 is the one saving grace about a very bad system where we have corrupted healthcare uh, with the provision of abortion. But that, that issue at least does not arise that a person could possibly feel personally targeted. And that's why those who say uh, and allege that those who want to witness against abortion are out to be, to use the minister's you know, iniquitous phrase, in people's faces. Nobody is in anybody's face here. Nobody wants to be in anybody's face here. And let those who do want to be in anybody's face, let them be targeted by the public order legislation. So let's have no more of this dishonesty from the government. There's law in the statute books, as the Garda Commissioner said. But for those who want to engage in the kind of witness to human dignity that has not caused a problem in the eyes of the Limerick Hospital, that has not caused a problem in the eyes of uh, the Cork Hospital, and the only people that the Minister has been able to draw on is the highly questionable document from the HSE, given that it is, as I said, hand in glove with the government, and um, uh, uh, what I would regard as a discredited abortion advocacy group. Let's be in no doubt about this. The impetus from this legislation is not coming from ordinary people who have felt intimidated and have got in touch. This is coming from ideological groups who have got in touch with Sinn Féin, with Fianna Fáil, with Fine Gael, with the Greens and whose opinions are in vogue and who have to, don't have to try very hard for access at all. And as I said, we saw this insiderism and we've seen it in recent days. Um, we welcomed and I add my welcome to the representative from the National Women's Council of Ireland. And there's an organisation that has completely failed to represent the diversity of women's views across the country. Yes, the bill now in yes. A, in a huge but he, he, he does, I, I accept that, but it does indicate the insiderism that's going on. Because there you have an organisation that's getting 95 or 96 percent of its staffing costs out there uh, canvassing in a referendum for one side without having consulted with ordinary people, without even, as far as I know, having consulted with its member organisations. Senator, I hate, I, hate, in, I hate interrupting, but you, you, you are yeah, really yeah, gone yeah. beyond. Notwithstanding the McKenna principles, no, which no, say public and, money and, shouldn't and be not used. Notwithstanding that I'm, yeah. I'm genuinely okay. respectful of your position, I understand. as you know well, yeah. but you are really. Yeah meandering across okay. the bill now with a I, lot of different okay. pieces. Okay, understood, of, understood. You. Two other points here. My friend and colleague Tom referenced laicite. Mm -hmm. He seemed to think that, and he turned to me as he said it, that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mind, yeah I am, but I, obviously I have to I know. try and challenge the arguments that are being advanced against the amendment. And I, hate, and I, I, hate, I hate interrupting you, but you are... Yeah, yeah, no, I know, and I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm not, I'm trying not to say anything twice. I know, but okay. you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm afraid you haven't succeeded it's, in it's that, just a, There's a lot of good examples here, because the Minister's case is so weak. <laughs> you um, haven't succeeded in that, anyway. Yeah, yeah. the, the laicite point, uh, I'm not sure it is the definition of laicite, by the way, that there is civil space from which uh, faith voices uh, uh, have to be completely excluded. Uh, first of all, as I explained, this isn't about a religious view necessarily. There are many people who have no religious faith but who see this issue exclusively through a human rights lens. So I think there's, that, that was Tom's first misunderstanding, that this is about religious and then he said ideological. He, do, he did appear to accept the word, this is philosophical, this is what's the value we place on human life and what, to what extent should we protect people's right to communicate freely in our society, um, particularly around life and death issues. Those are the values that are in play. Laïcity, as far as I know, relates to the institutions of state that shouldn't be um, 
show favouritism to one uh, faith or another. And French, the French, there's an ideology of laicite built into the French system. But I don't think it involves uh, kicking uh, uh, religious voices or faith representatives out of any portion of civil space. It certainly isn't about excluding people uh, from public ground and from public streets the way the, the, the ministers um, um, uh, proposed uh, legislation would do. So I think laicite is the, it, it's, a, it's, it's to miscue, I think, to try and evoke a laicite. Um, but Tom did refer to, you know, protesters that he described as performative, uh, and, and then he talked about it outside in the, what he called the provision of healthcare. But I suppose what I think would invite him to try and understand more clearly is that for those witnesses, abortion is not bona fide healthcare. It is an a profoundly unjust elective procedure. I'm not talking about the necessary medical procedures that can result in the loss of an unborn child, but I'm talking about elective uh, voluntary abortion, which is now provided um, in GP surgeries and in, 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 in hospitals. And if you don't see that as healthcare, then are you, are you entitled in a democracy to be in the street, to be in the vicinity of such places, provided you are not targeting the individual or the institution, to put a counter message of, that is positive. And the messages I would want to see are those that offer a better solution than abortion. And if there is a hope that somebody going in there who you don't know might see that and might be encouraged to have a conversation with somebody else in their family or otherwise, or to have maybe second thoughts. You know what, that would be a good thing if a life was saved. You know, it's all about the how of this. And that's why I go back and say that the amendment that I was proposing, you know, protects, um, you know, there is an honorable compromise in that, which the minister didn't, I'm sorry to say, have the generosity to acknowledge that there is an attempt here to find some kind of a via media, but as I say, Borg-like, uh, it is, computer says, no, uh, we, we, will, we will keep going. We will not open our hearts to the possibility that you might have a heart. Uh, and that's the problem. Um, because what my amendment would do, and just to correct my friend and colleague, Senator Martin, there isn't any question about leaving 100 metres, uh, you know, the freedom, the, 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 the law as the minister has drafted it would, 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 would make sure that there isn't a 100 metre bar in other words, people who would protest in the vicinity of Leinster House would not fall foul of any 100 metre rule. Okay, that's what the minister is proposing. The amendment I'm proposing is it gets rid of the 100 metres, um, but it maintains the standard for protest outside. Uh, in other words, what it would do is it would apply the Dahl standard to everywhere. In other words, you are completely free to protest outside the Dáil, even if it's within 100 metres of an abortion facility, provided your protest advocacy or dissent is not directed at a specific relevant healthcare premises or persons accessing a relevant healthcare premises. So what I'm saying is, let's make the Dáil standard the universal standard. And that's the via media that the minister didn't even address his mind to, because he was too busy in trying to bally rag and to try and discredit and insult me. I don't mind being personally having a go at. Every word I've said here today is truthful. That I can, I, can, I, can, I can take the book on. But what I am saying and inviting the minister is to retreat from his hardline position and to at least engage in conversation with people he doesn't like. It doesn't have to be me, Stephen. It can be anybody you want, but somebody who would at least invite you to consider whether your doll and rock the standard could actually be the useful standard to apply across the board, which is to say that a person would be free to engage in lawful protest, advocacy or dissent, provided it's not directed at a specific relevant health care premises or persons accessing a relevant health care premises. You would, in addition to the public order legislation, which prevents threatening, abusive, insulting or obscene behaviour, you have a formula there that could work without attacking freedom of expression, without turning people who have concerns about abortion and who want to witness to them in a public place 
um, uh, notwithstanding that it may be in some way within the zone uh, of, of, of a healthcare facility. Or indeed, as I said, people on, on a witness march who might be passing within 100 metres. You have a clear formula to work on there uh, between now and report stage. And if I could also say, and I think this is my last undelivered point, second last, think for a moment if there was a protest, because it was mentioned, outside a facility, a migrant reception facility, or where asylum seekers might be getting um, direct provision. We can all see clearly how such a protest should not be allowed once it in any way um, is directed at a person. And that was why I don't like and don't support the idea that there would be protests at people um, going in and out of a facility in the context of our evolving migration debate. The old laws of Christian charity can, can apply in, in a secular society very effectively. You don't need to change much of the language to see what human decency requires. But let's just say that people were protesting outside an asylum uh, facility, a, a reception centre. Let's say they were protesting against the injustice of the way uh, migrants were being treated. Shouldn't that be allowed? Because in many ways that's the much more valid uh, comparison. Because what the witness um, uh, uh, that might take place within the vicinity, or you know, within 100 metres of, of an abortion providing facility, it's effectively a witness against injustice, you know, and a call to a better way uh, of doing medicine. And it's not government, it's just a, a, a small number, according to Cork University Hospital, of very powerless people in society who just seek to witness. And sometimes it might even be, it, it might be prayer, not my personal style, but other people's in our democracy. Um, Lastly, to what my friend and colleague, Senator Paul Gavin, said, where he said that the last thing a woman needs are protesters of any kind. And I would invite him to think about the possibility that people here are not protesting, but they are witnessing. And again, if we can apply the standards of what is done, and if we can address our minds to the standards of how people witness and make their point, as opposed to the blanket ban that captures the courteous as well as the aggressive. I'm interested in targeting the aggressive. I defend the rights of the courteous. And, you know, that, I would invite him to do that. And he talked about privacy. But there is clearly no invasion of privacy in circumstances where no person uh, standing in the street 50 yards from Hollis Street Hospital knows anything about why a person is walking past them on that street, whether or not they enter the doors of that hospital. There is no attack on privacy. There is no attack on dignity, provided there is nothing uh, in the, what is being said or displayed that doesn't offend um, the uh, public order um, legislation. And I would say that respect for the unborn and for the unborn's mother has to be the hallmark uh, of any witnessing um, outside a facility or in, within 100 metres of a facility that I, that, that, that I would support. So I've put it as well as I can. I think the minister's, the minister's only response here today has been to attack those of us who are concerned about this le legislation and try and portray us as heartless, as wanting to be in people's faces, and so on. But caricaturing your opponent is no way uh, to govern responsibly. What we have tabled here today are amendments. Amendments that seek to strike an honourable middle ground that, to my mind, are more constitutionally focused in that they protect freedom of expression uh, and are more proof against eventual challenge to this legislation and also uh, that seek to create that balance whereby the same standard can be applied uh, to a protest regardless of its, whether it's outside the Dáil or anywhere else, that there's no distinction, um, that there's no cordon sanitaire, 
but that the standard is that protest, advocacy or dissent is not directed at a specific relevant healthcare premises or, per or persons accessing a relevant healthcare pr premises. That's an honourable compromise. And that is what I would ask the Minister and his civil servants to think about between now and report stage. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. And another? Senator Riley, on Amendment 3, being discussed with 4 and 7. That's fine, yeah. yeah. It's, it's on the 100 metres. Thank you very much, Cahir Lock. Um, look, I think, you know, on the one hand, what Senator Mullen is saying is that there's no problem, there's no issue here. Uh, and if that's the case, then he shouldn't have an objection to this legislation at all, that there's, there's no protest, is what he's saying, outside any of these facilities. Therefore, um, therefore we... we we, shouldn't be, we should have no issue with passing this legislation. But look, that aside, what I would say is that the idea that women who are going in to access health care need other people in their faces to remind them to think about something, I think is, is highly patronising. Everybody thinks before they access a form of health care. It's also not about giving information to women because we all know where to access information. Thank you very much. Um, what we know is this is about the future. This is about ensuring that people are not intimidated in their daily lives as they're going to work and that they're not intimidated as they're accessing health care. Um, and so for, for all of those reasons, I think we need to press on to make sure that um, people are not um, stopped, I suppose, from, from accessing health care. And the reason that I say that is because I'm from the west of Ireland. I know how few doctors there are providing abortions, I fundamentally believe that part of that is because of the fear of these kind of protests. Um, and I think that that's deeply unfair. The people of Ireland have spoken. We listened. We will listen again when they speak this Friday. Um, that's what we're here to do. Thank you very much. Any other senators wishing? Minister, do you want to? No. Uh, can I ask the senator how stands the amendment? Are you pushing the amendment? Um, no, I'm withdrawing it uh, with a view to reintroducing it at report stage. If that's okay. okay. Is that agreed? Yes. Agreed. Amendment number four in the names of Muller and Keoghan already discussed with amendment number three. How stands the amendment? Oh, you moved. Uh, we, 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 we moved, moved it, it sorry. and we'll withdraw it uh, in anticipation of reintroducing it at report stage. That agreed? Uh, amendment number five. Names of Muller and Keoghan already discussed with, with one. Are you moving the motion? Uh, move and withdraw. I, I think it was moved the last day, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that agreed? Yeah. Amendment number six in the name of Muller and Keoghan. Six and eight are related and may be discussed together by agreement. Is that agreed? Yeah. Senator Muller. Okay. I just need a second now just to... Mm -hmm. Get myself organised. I'll get you to move it first, Senator. Okay, I, I, first of all, I, I move it, please. Thank you. Um. So this amendment provides that uh, in page six. Uh, between lines 19 and 20 um, that the following lines uh, would be inserted uh, that nothing in section 2 subsection 2 shall prohibit a person from engaging in silent prayer uh, in a public place um, now bear with me So this um, obviously comes in under the section uh, that provides for exceptions uh, to the principle uh, set out in, uh, to the requirements set out in section two of the legislation. Let's remember that not every part of what this legislation proposes is, is problematic. Uh, section two, subsection one says that a person shall not without lawful authority in a safe access zone engage in conduct that is likely to obstruct or impede another person from accessing a relevant healthcare premises and with intent to obstruct or impede that person from availing of or providing termination of pregnancy services or being reckless 
as to whether such person is thereby so obstructed or impeded. I have no problem uh, following the logic that if something is legal in the country, however much I might regret it, that a person should not be obstructed or impeded uh, from accessing a, a legally uh, available uh, service. Okay? So, the problem part is the much more intolerant, much less democratic, much more constitutionally subject provision in section 2, subsection 2, which says that subject to the exceptions that we're now looking at, a person shall not in a safe access zone communicate material to the public or a section of the public in a manner that is likely to influence the decision of another person in relation to, to availing of or providing termination of pregnancy services or otherwise engaging in conduct directed at the public or a section of the public in a manner that is likely to influence the decision of a person in relation to availing of or providing termination of pregnancy services with intent to influence the decision of such a person in relation to availing of or providing termination of pregnancy services are being reckless as to whether such a decision is thereby so influenced. So clearly what we're talking about here is that just communicating material to the public in general, okay? And it doesn't actually matter whether that material is intended to promote the idea of having an abortion or to discourage the idea of having an abortion. That information may not be communicated to the public or to, the, to a section of the public uh, in a safe access zone. So just, just to be clear, and section, sub, sub, again, subsection 3, no problem with it. A person shall not engage in conduct that is likely to threaten or intimidate a person who is accessing or attempting to access a relevant uh, health care premises. You know what? A person shall not in a safe access zone. A person shouldn't do it anywhere, anywhere, engage in conduct, conduct that's likely to threaten or intimidate a person who's accessing or attempting to access a relevant health care healthcare premises. Like what a strange requirement to, to, to just to confine that. I'm sure it would be unlawful anyway under other laws, but the idea that you would kind of specify that this shouldn't happen in a safe access zone almost seems to condone the idea that threatening and intimidation could go on legally uh, somewhere else, you know. Or a person shall not accompany, follow or repeatedly approach a person who is accessing or attempting to access uh, a relevant healthcare premises with intent to influence the decision in relation to uh, uh, abortion and so on. Like, that stuff would all be covered uh, under other law anyway. But needless to say, nobody can have any problem with, with that, except to the extent that you wonder, is it by implication condoning such unacceptable behaviour outside of a safe access zone? But in any case, the problem, the problem section is all about the one on communicating uh, material uh, to the public. And it is to that section, therefore, that exceptions were considered necessary by the government. But the problem is, of course, that the exceptions don't go far enough. Now, we've already dealt with, um, at committee stage at least, uh, my proposal that a person wouldn't be, uh, a, that, 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 uh, that seeks to exclude um, the vicinity um, of a house of the Oireachtas uh, from coming within the, I suppose, the, uh, the enclosure of a, of a safe um, access zone, the curtilage, I suppose you might say, of a, safe, of, 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 of a, health, of a healthcare facility for safe access zone purposes. Um, and, and we've dealt with that, uh, and, I, and I have made my point there that that via media that applies um, uh, to the... Um, uh, it's not that it's getting rid of the 100 metre zone, but, but it is providing that, that, that material may be communicated to the public, provided such act, uh, protest, acts or dissent is not directed at a specific healthcare premises. Now, the second exception is that nothing uh, shall prohibit a person from engaging in lawful conduct that occurs inside a place of religious worship. I think that may need to be extended to, to mean the entire premises of, of, of a place of religious worship. Um, but the, um, the third one, then, that nothing shall prohibit anything done by a relevant healthcare provider or any person employed 
uh, including the provision of information. So that's protecting the healthcare institution. And it is at that point that I'm proposing that the additional section be put in, that nothing in section 2.2 shall prohibit a person from engaging in silent prayer in a public place. It might seem strange in this day and age when um, people um, appear still for the most part to believe in, in constitutional rights and, and freedoms, to think that you would actually have to put the issue beyond doubt uh, that a person would be entitled uh, to engage um, in silent prayer. But of course we did see an incident um, in the United Kingdom uh, not too long ago um, um, uh, where a policeman effectively harassed a person and asked them were they engaging in prayer, if I recall, and I think the answer they gave was that they might be. And uh, I forget how it, worked, it went precisely from there, but I think it ended up with the person anyway not being prosecuted. But as we've said so often in the context of the hate speech legislation, it is sometimes the process that becomes the punishment that even if there was never a question of a person being brought uh, before the courts, the very fact that they are approached um, by the forces of law and order. I know myself, I'm not the best driver in the world, but I try and obey the law. But there have been occasions when I've heard that noise behind me and seen the blue light in the rear view mirror and the heart gives a little lurch and you say, oh God, have I done something wrong, you know? And, even though I kind of sometimes feel, well, you either have or you haven't, so you shouldn't be getting that heart lurch. But the fact is, most of us, I think, are, uh, are, are try to be solid citizens. So it's anathema, I think, to most decent people to think that they would ever be doing something uh, that would bring about a situation where they might be approached by a Garda and told to move on or told, you know, you're not really you're not really doing something that, that's considered uh, socially acceptable or you could be on the threshold of breaching public order or you could be breaking the law on, on safe access zones and so on. Um, so it seems to me that one should explicitly provide uh, for the possibility that if a person is so concerned, it's not something I've ever done, by the injustice of abortion and that they feel the need to be within 100 meters and to express silent prayer or express pr prayer silently. Given the way our Western societies seem to be going in terms of cutting back on, 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 on civil freedoms, including freedom of expression, um, that there should be a, a particular a defense because the argument could be made and I don't say that it's beyond dispute, but the argument could be made that um, the bill um, doesn't explicitly uh, criminalize silent prayer. But given the breadth of section two, subsection two, okay, um, that is relating to uh, communicating material to the public and so on, or otherwise engaging in conduct directed at the public. Given the breadth of that section two, subsection two, and considered in conjunction uh, with section one and subsections two, five, uh, six, or seven. And I just remind colleagues that section one there, obviously we're in the interpretation uh, section, and uh, subsections, um, um, And, and, and sections two, five, six, and seven um, give the definition effect of a, for the section two, subsection five says that for the purpose of this section, a person shall be regarded as communicating material to the public or a section of the public if the person displays, publishes, distributes, or disseminates the material, shows or plays the material or makes the material available in any other way, including through the use of an information system to the public or section of the public. Subsection six says, for the purposes of this section, 
A person's conduct shall include conduct of any kind, and in particular, things that the person says or otherwise communicates, as well as things that the person does, and such conduct may consist of a single act or a course of conduct. And again, that, I think, invites doubt. For the purposes of this section, a person's conduct shall include conduct of any kind. Could that be standing silently, head bowed, and in particular, things that the person says or otherwise communicates? Well, that's not, that's not a problem. As well as things that the person does, and such conduct may consist of a single act or a course of conduct. Remember, in a free society, the rights that we seek to protect in a democracy are not just the rights we can relate to ourselves. You know, I don't see myself ever getting down on my knees within 60 yards of Hollis Street Hospital where I lament what's going on or any other abortion providing healthcare facility. That's not my bag, so to speak. But as a Democrat and as a legislator, I must defend the right of somebody who might wish to go on their knees and silently um, uh, witness to the injustice of what's going on. I think of the Falun Gong protesters, for example, that we sometimes come across on Grafton Street and other places, and I've often engaged with them. Um, and I think of their, how they are wronged, as so many other groups are, by the Chinese authorities. And I think of their very simple, non-aggressive witness to their personal distinctiveness of what they do and what they stand for. And I say to myself when I meet them, you know, well, at least in Ireland, for all our problems, those people can stand on Grafton Street unmolested, you know? And that was why I was concerned when I saw a number of months ago a character called Billboard Chris, uh, who goes around the world and he's protesting against uh, the giving of puberty blockers to, to, to children, obviously in the context of transgender ideology that says self-ID, give them the puberty blockers, move them on to cross-sex hormones, and then eventually these mutilating and life-damaging surgeries. And he makes a simple message, something like, it's wrong to give puberty blockers to kids. And he found himself with his sandwich board standing on Grafton Street a few months ago. I wrote an article in the Irish Examiner about it. And he was approached by a Garda who was extremely polite to him. And Bill, Billboard Chris, being an activist, was, I would say, somewhat rude to the Garda, more rude than I would have been, dismissive. But the irony was, the Garda was completely polite, but was completely in the wrong. There was no legal basis. I know that. But I, but the it, it's not irrelevant, because what I'm trying to do I is know, to... I know, but you're straying a bit off. I, but to address an issue of what matters in our society in terms of respecting people's freedoms. Because the irony in that case was, Bill, the Garda was, com was completely polite, but in the wrong, on the law, and not acting in the best interest of a free and open democracy. Whereas Billboard Chris, this Canadian guy was completely in the right in terms of asserting his right to say something that was truthful and that was not threatening, abusive, or indecent, or obscene. Again, I'm constantly going back to the public order legislation words. Um, I would say he was in the wrong in that he could have been much more diplomatic. But I suppose he felt he had to make the point. And of course, you never know with these activists, he probably would have benefited from being arrested and the thing would go viral. And I'm not making any comment on that. But what I'm saying is this. I want to live in a society where we err on the side of letting people be awkward, short of intimidating or harassing or abusing other people. That's the balance we strike in a society. And therefore, the rights I'm seeking to defend here. I have a forum, and I have several fora, in which I can communicate my distress that we have a law in this country that allows the killing of innocent children. And as long as I live, I will not let that issue go undiscussed, and I will challenge media, I will challenge people in power, and so on. And there are many more who feel like I do. We will always do so in a way that tries to respect the people involved, because we know that there's suffering very often in their situation, and you don't ever want to target them. You want to target the wrongdoers who carry out these dreadful procedures. 
But I have a forum to talk about this issue. But lots of ordinary people do not. They're maybe not as literate as they would like to be in terms of having the, con or indeed, they might lack the confidence to write the letter to the editor or to ring up the Joe Duffy program. They might be people who are not schooled in logic and debate, but they have their beliefs, and they're decent people, and they're sincere, and they may be people of faith from which they draw inspiration, where faith is relevant, and it's not always relevant to people's pro-life witness. And those people are also deserving of respect in our society. And I would say that we should put the issue beyond doubt that if it is simply a matter of silent prayer, that such people will not be criminalized. And this is one situation where you could say that a person could be on their knees outside Croke Park and nobody would know why they were on their knees. Uh, they might be praying for their team to win. But a person who might want to engage in silent witness might want to be seen to be doing so. Uh, or maybe doesn't want to be seen to do anything, but may feel in their hearts that the power of what they are doing, spiritual or otherwise, finds its expression in that they're going to the place or the vicinity of a place and silently witnessing or silently praying. If that's their bag, they should be protected in our society. We cannot make such people the prisoners or the victims of the minister's feelings or the feelings of an abortion advocacy group that wants to crush all dissent. And certainly, in the absence of any reports from healthcare providers, direct healthcare providers, not the sham stuff from the HSE that gets cooked up to feed into debates around here, but real evidence from people involved, whether I like what they're doing or not, in the absence of any evidence, we should not be curtailing uh, people's uh, freedom uh, of expression. So I am saying that the argument could be made that the bill doesn't explicitly criminalize silent prayer. I'll hear what the minister has to say respectfully on that. But given the breadth of section two, subsection two, considered in conjunction with sections one and sections two, five, six, seven, as I said, under the bill as currently worded, it is quite possible that even silent prayer, if one can tell by looking at the person that he or she is praying, for example, joined hands, closed eyes, standing still in the relevant spot, holding a rosary beads or whatever, or lips moving without sound, could that be conduct that may consist of a single act or course of conduct? I don't think that should be left to the courts. I know the minister wants the minister needs government want whatever everything to go to court these days, including the meaning of durable relationship. They're storing up a, a bright, prosperous new future for lawyers. And this will be one more possible example of where we'll be putting doubt. But you see, the point is this: even if the thing never went to court, this has the potential to intimidate people, to intimidate ordinary and powerless people. So if a person is praying, as I've said. Sorry? Senator. So would the women Senator, need healthcare? Sorry, vulnerable. please, Senator. And some of them may be the people. Senator, yeah. please don't. Yeah. Yeah. Senator, and I would, yeah, and standing still in the relevant spot, as I've said. And as I said, and I, and I thank Senator McGeehan for her relevant and helpful um, intervention, because it reminds me that these people could be people that have a story themselves. They may have an abortion story. There are women who deeply regret their abortion who regret that the state and the apparatus of state did nothing to point them in the, more, in the direction of more positive alternatives. There are some, not all, who have had adverse mental health sequelae. There are some who have found counselling, some who are spiritual, some who are maybe not, but who have found counselling and support from people, including from pro-life people, that has helped them get over their sorrow. And some of those people might I would suggest to my friend Senator McGreen, be among those people who want to silently witness in this way. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I don't know if that's what you were saying, but it, I think you're, you're a fair person and we've agreed on things the way we've disagreed on things. There's people on both sides here, you know? And, um, you know, if we could only let people show a bit of love to each other, 
we could maybe understand that the witnessing that can go on, in fact, quite far from being adversarial, can be something that is intended in a spirit of deep friendship and concern uh, for the other. Um, because my concern is that unless it's made clear, there will be a question in people's minds that even if they're standing still in the same spot, that they could be in breach of section two, subsection two, if the requisite, requisite I'm sorry, if the requisite intent or recklessness is deemed to be, is deemed to be present. So that's the position as far as I can put it, and I would ask the Minister again. It's again, I'll just indicate that I, I won't be pressing it at this point because I am really keen to see the Minister and the apparatus of state engage with these concerns, particularly as I fear that they have not engaged with, sought to engage with, or responded positively to any requests they might have received uh, from people representing the broader pro-life concern in our society, which is a substantial number of people, as you know, in the minister's constituency as well as everywhere else. And um, I fear that this is one of these, I know that this is one of these pieces of legislation that has really only heard from one side up to this point. And that's why this is such a critical moment, because it's been through the doll, and yet again we find ourselves in the Shannad Giving, the same, giving greater scrutiny as we did with the hate speech legislation, as we did with the referendum bills, even though we were guillotined, but we still put it out clearly and cogently and are still doing so, and doing a job that was not adequately done in the Dáil. And we're doing it here again on this safe access legislation, with due respect, by the way, to colleagues in the Dáil who have done their very best. But this is our last chance now, because it has been through the Dáil, and we need to consider the constitutional implications and the question of whether there is a via media possible here, an honourable compromise that could turn this legislation from being something that seeks to crush dissent ruthlessly into something that articulates a concern that some people may have, reasonably or unreasonably, but which seeks also to recognise that there are other people deserving of respect uh, in our society who might respectfully want to uh, contribute their, 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 their deep values into this very troubling situation. Thank you, Senator. Any other Senator? Senator Keoghan. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Senator Mullen, uh, for your in-depth contribution there on this, on this particular amendment. So this would ensure that silent prayer would be protected. Uh, already in England, we've seen a case of several people who have been interrogated arrested and fined for simply standing in the vicinity of abortion providers and silently praying without holding any signs or making any statements. One man, Adam Smith Connor, was asked by a police officer, what is the nature of your prayer? And when he said he was praying for the unborn child and in memory of his son who was aborted, he was arrested. This is Orwellian and breaches Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which includes the freedom of thought, conscience and religion. The bill, as it currently stands, makes it quite possible that we would see similar situations to this, where people could be arrested for silently engaging in private prayer, prayer if they happened to be within one of the sprawling 100 metre zones. What about our protections for prayer, which are the ordinary customary practice, which is inherently public in nature and unrelated to protest or advocacy, i.e. the Corpus Christi processions, uh, graveyards near a hospital, may have a funeral, where a rosary is being said during a public procession, a wedding or indeed an outdoor place. So this amendment would prevent that possibility. So any religious activity, it doesn't matter what it is, those days are, those uh, holy days are Senator really Kogan, important. Uh, this is only just at this stage, as it's now two o'clock, the debate oh, stands right, adjourned okay. in accordance with the order of the House today.